And thanks for joining. This is Travis Durek. I'm a product manager here at Peplink. And today we're going to walk you through the upcoming firmware 8.1.0. There's all kinds of cool new stuff in here. So I think you guys will enjoy this. So as always, the mission of Peplink is to deliver unbreakable connectivity anytime, anywhere. And 8.1.0 definitely follows that tradition. There's all kinds of new features here to help you stay up and stay connected as fast as possible. So there's two ways to get the beta firmware. You can go to our forum and download it there. Actually, I guess there's three ways. You can get it from the forum. You can go to our open beta program page on our website. Just Google Peplink open beta. You'll probably find it that way. Or you can get it directly from in control two. We'll show you how that works a little bit later in the show. So right now, this 8.1.0 firmware is in beta 4. We expect the first release candidate to be launched next week. And so uh, almost guaranteed this will be a generally available firmware in July. So we're coming, coming up real quick on that, that being an officially released firmware. So I would definitely encourage you to, to go check it out and try it now. So what's in it? First thing, we launched Speed Fusion Cloud back in uh, March, and that was a special build firmware. And so now uh, 810 is going to be the first generally available firmware that has Speed Fusion Cloud in, integrated in it. And there's a lot of improvements there. So we'll, we'll be doing a live demo a little bit later in the show. So you'll get to see what I'm talking about there. But lots of enhancements, lots of new functionality. So I think you'll really appreciate what's what's developed with the Speed Fusion Cloud. So those that aren't familiar with it, the Speed Fusion Cloud is a new service that we launched again in March to let people get the, the benefits of Speed Fusion without having to set up a bunch of their own infrastructure. Previously to, to get the benefits of Speed Fusion, you needed to have either a, a, another router or a Fusion Hub hosted out in the cloud to allow you to get those SD-WAN benefits of Speed Fusion. So Speed Fusion Cloud takes that away. It makes it just a, a really simple point and click type of setup so that you can do bonding, failover, and all kinds of other different strategies with Speed Fusion. Again, with this, just a single router, or if you've got several locations, you can connect all of them to Speed Fusion Cloud. So it's a subscription service that really makes it much easier to get the benefits of Speed Fusion. And again, we'll demonstrate this in a little bit. So there's lots of other things to talk about in firmware 810. One really big one is drop-in mode is being supported on all of our products now. Uh, that used to be either unavailable or a paid add-on for the lower end products. And so when you look at something like the BR1 Mini, all of a sudden that has drop-in mode. That enables all kinds of expanded use cases for those lower end products. So if you're a managed service provider and you wanna come in to bring phone service into a company who's already got an existing network, uh, you can protect that phone traffic with the BR1 Mini. You can put it in drop-in mode, integrate it really really seamlessly with their existing infrastructure. So it gives, it gives customers a whole bunch more flexibility on, across our entire model line. So it's not a, a segmented feature anymore. Another unique one is what we're calling our unbreakable time server. So there, there's two layers to this. Number one, the, the Peplink routers are now able to serve as an NTP server. And so that allows them to be an authoritative time source for any devices on the network. So you can think of like IP cameras, IP phones, um, and public safety, obviously this is gonna be a big deal for them. They've got lots of different systems that need a really accurate time source. And so this gives you one right embedded into the Peplink router. The other thing that we've added or expanded is the Peplink router previously would reach out to an upstream NTP server on the internet for its time source. And now what we're doing is we're allowing that, th those devices that have a cellular radio in there with GPS to get the time synchronization directly from GPS as well. And so we'll show you how those work a little bit later. They're real easy to configure, very straightforward, but again, very powerful feature. Uh, a lot of companies or, or Again, public safety agencies end up buying separate net clock devices. And so now this really 
eliminates the need for that. Another upgrade we've done is we've added bandwidth bonding to our MediaFast 500 and 700 routers. So again, that used to be a paid upgrade. That is now included by default with those routers. So I'm sure a welcome addition for people that own those products. Another really unique one is the TCP accelerator support. So those of you that deal with things like satellite links are probably very familiar with TCP acceleration. And so it's been a request for a long time to enable TCP acceleration on speed fusion so that it can be compatible with, more compatible with, with things like satellite links. And so what we've done in 810 is we've enabled the TCP sessions to be exposed even though they still remain encrypted. So that TCP acceleration that's built into things like satellite modems can work on speed fusion traffic. So we'll show you how to configure that a little bit later as well. Some other really cool things, which we're not gonna show today, but definitely reach out if you've got an interest in using these features. Uh, we've added some new virtualization options to our products. Uh, the EPX is now able to run virtual machines and Docker. And so that was a, an addition that was planned from the get-go, but we finally got that released. And then any, any media fast product, um, and then a couple of the new products like the, the MBX have optional capabilities to enable the Content Hub feature. And so the products that have that Content Hub feature are now able to do full operating system virtualization. So we're utilizing a technology called KVM to virtualize any operating system you want and run that directly on that Peplink router that has the Content Hub capability. So you could run a Windows virtual machine right inside your Peplink router so that you can eliminate the need for additional servers or all additional infrastructure at your customer location. Uh, this can be very important in harsh environments. So like railway projects where industry certifications are, are a must, uh, it's oftentimes much easier to get that virtual machine running on the router that's already certified and, and ruggedized for those environments. So definitely a powerful option for those folks looking to do pretty sophisticated applications. Another big point of 810 is upgrading the wireless security capabilities. And this extends to both the router's built-in Wi-Fi for those that have it and the AP controller in integrated in most of our products as well. So WPA3 is a new Wi-Fi wi security standard. So any 11AC, any routers that have an 11AC radio in them should support the WPA3 directly on that built-in access point. Again, all of the access point controllers are able to configure this security setting for access points that are capable of it. And you'll start to see this WPA3 capability show up on our access point products, uh, like the 11AC capable ones in the next firmware version. So those of you that have our 11AC Wave 2 products, those already support WPA3 in the current firmware. Those of you that have like an AP1 Enterprise, that's the first generation 11AC products. You'll see a firmware update coming out soon to support WPA3 on those as well. We're also supporting 802.11W on the Wi-Fi WAN. So lots of upgrades on the Wi-Fi technology here. Another area of focus for 810 is on traffic analysis. So we've got a couple different ways this plays out here. Uh, on the speed fusion side, we've got, we've, we've really enhanced the graphs for speed fusion. So you can get a lot deeper information and, and understanding of what's going on in your speed fusion network. So you can better troubleshoot and evaluate the performance of that. We'll show you those a little bit later. As always, we keep expanding our DPI capabilities. So the signature database has grown pretty extensively in this version. So you'll, you'll find that the, the DPI reports and the DPI steering capabilities, as well as content blocking capabilities, are all a lot more granular now. And you'll see a lot more popular applications that, that customers have been looking for in there. So again, we'll show you that as well. 
NetFlow is another one. If you know what this is, you're probably excited about it. If you don't, not anything you have to get too worried about, but we'll show you how this works in a little bit. NetFlow is a lot like Deep Packet Inspection and SNMP, so it just sends metadata about all the different traffic utilization on your network to uh, an external server that does its own analysis. So it's not a direct feature that Peplink's exposing in the UI, but it allows you to send that NetFlow stream to a, a third-party NetFlow collector for, for larger networks. So we'll show you where that lives right now. Okay, so I don't have a whole lot of slides for today. I figured it's a lot more valuable for you guys to see how this stuff works in, in the router directly. So I'm gonna just pause my screen and we'll start pulling up. I've got, I think, nine different features that I'm gonna show you guys today. So just give me a second here. Okay, well, we're pulling up our remote web admin on a router, and the first thing we're going to show you is the SpeedFusion Cloud. Again, this has been greatly expanded since the first firmware that supported SpeedFusion Cloud. And remote web admin is taking a long time because I'm live on a demo, of course. So we'll give this just a second. Okay, sorry for the delay, folks. So the new firmware, there's direct, there's a new tab at the top of the, the router user interface. I don't think that's happened for, since the Max product line came out, so kind of a dramatic shift for your eyeballs if you're used to looking at our, our router interface, but there's a lot of great stuff here. So the first thing we can do, if we look at which locations we wanna choose, you can select them here. And so I'm just gonna clear these out and kind of start over. So when you first enable SpeedFusion Cloud, when you first register that license, that's what's gonna expose this tab here. So if you haven't done that, check our form out. There's a registration process so you can get the demo set up. Uh, but once you've done that, this tab is gonna show up and right away you can just choose which location. By default, you can just choose automatic. It works great. It's gonna choose the, the closest location to you based on latency. Um, but you can also just manually select which locations you want to connect to. So I'm just going to choose, you can choose up to three of them. I'm going to choose just a few of them here. I'm going to say Japan, New York, and let's go to London as well. Okay, so if I click Apply Changes, the router is going to automatically start establishing connections to all three of those cloud locations. Another really cool thing you can do though, is you can modify these just like you would a normal SpeedFusion profile. So you can create all kinds of different, different tunnel profiles that are then gonna be mirrored on the, on the other side of the SpeedFusion cloud so that you get all the performance benefits that you want from each mode. So let's say the default tunnel will make hot failover. And so I'm gonna make my broadband, the highest priority. And then I've got three cellular interfaces that we can fail over to. Now, if you're not very familiar with the connection priority down here, I'll explain how this works. If you're choosing links in a certain priority and, and then you have a, a link in another priority, the tunnel's only gonna actively use whatever links are in the highest priority. If you have more than one link in a priority group, that means you're basically bonding those links together. So in this case, we are using just the broadband if that's available and if that fails, then we're gonna fail over to a bonded cellular connection. And so you're actually combining hot failover and bonding in this profile. Let 
Now, you can also do things like WAN smoothing with Speed Fusion Cloud. So we're going to put that at normal. So normal, if you're not sure about WAN smoothing, you can read the tool tip here. Basically, it's a packet redundancy protocol so that you can lower your average latency for latency sensitive applications like voice over IP. And you can basically eliminate packet loss. As long as you've got a couple links in play, you can you can duplicate your traffic so that you're always getting the best performance on every single packet and you're going to get completely seamless failover if, if one of those links drops. You're not even going to hear audio drop for a second. You can also do forward air correction with Speed Fusion Cloud now. So forward air correction is somewhat similar to WAN smoothing, but it's different in, a, in another way. It's a lot more efficient. So your overhead is going to be a lot lower. Instead of duplicating your packets, you're only generating either 13 or 26% overhead. So you're sending some parity bits to kind of help you reassemble packets if there's packet loss. Uh, forward air correction is usually great for video streaming. Uh, it's not as ideal for audio streaming. Uh, audio is a lot more sensitive to latency. Usually video streams, even live ones, have a little bit of buffering in them. And so forward air correction needs just a small amount of time. Just, you know, we're talking milliseconds to reassemble those packets. So again, forward air correction, usually great for video. WAN smoothing, usually more ideal for real-time voice. But Again, with Speed Fusion Cloud, you can now utilize these technologies. And again, these settings are mirrored on the other side. So you've got really easy setup of these. Some other cool things you can do is you can connect specific devices to the cloud. So you can still use the outbound policies to steer traffic to the cloud, and we'll show you how that works in a second, but you can also just pick individual clients and choose where they where you want them to go. So I could send this AP1 over to Japan if I wanted. So you can just, it'll automatically populate your client list so you can pick and choose clients and basically enforce them to tunnel all their traffic to whichever Speed Fusion Cloud node you want. So if you've got a reason to pop up in Japan, you can just choose your iPhone or, or laptop or whatever device and have the, all of that device's traffic tunneled to whichever node you choose. Now, if it's a Wi-Fi enabled product, you can also do the same strategy with the Wi-Fi networks. I'll pull that up in a little bit here on a different model so you can see that, but you can create custom SSIDs that are then tunneled to whichever Speed Fusion Cloud node you want so that every device on that particular SSID is going to get tunneled. So lots of nice, easy, quick ways to get devices connected to the Speed Fusion Cloud. But again, you can also just use your outbound policies to do the same thing that you're used to doing with normal Speed Fusion tunnels. I want to point out to, we've got our deep packet inspection application steering feature that's been out, uh, I think, since eight, firmware 800. Um, but you need to enable expert mode to expose this capability. Expert mode's already turned on on this router, but if it's not on yours, you just open this tooltip here, and you'll be able to see the expert mode link to enable that. Once you do that, what you're able to do is you're able to use our deep packet inspection technology to steer specific applications to different tunnel profiles. So if I say the destination is Speed Fusion Cloud, I can say New York City, and then I can choose application. And so, like I said, the DPI signatures have expanded greatly in this firmware. And so if we look under voice over IP, you can see there's several things. So it's not just voice over IP. It's also like WebEx and Zoom, Skype. So it's a voice over IP and whatever web content sharing.
platforms you guys are using as well. So if we just choose that, then I can say, I want to send that to, I want to send that to my WAN smoothing profile so that I can guarantee that those streams don't get interrupted and we don't have a bad experience on, on a webinar or something like that. So that's how you can use those multiple tunnel profiles that you create in the Speed Fusion Cloud. The other thing that I want to point out is these application rules are going to assume that you're already sending uh, traffic to that tunnel and then you're further steering it to the right tunnel profile that you created. So next I'll show you the, speed fusion, the new Speed Fusion graphs. So if you look at the Speed Fusion status page, you're going to see a normal tunnel that I've got here, and then we've got several tunnels and, and sub-tunnels connected to the Speed Fusion cloud. You get the little cloud icon over here. So if we start opening these up, we'll just take a look. So here you can see we've got the hot failover tunnel. And so as we told it to, it's only using the broadband actively right now and it's got the cellular in standby, ready to, ready to take over if the broadband were to fail. The other profiles, we've just got everything in priority one. So you can see they're both active at the same time. Now, if we open the graph up, you can see some of the new features that are in here. So there's a lot more information here, which can be a little bit overwhelming, but once you know what it is, it's super helpful. So previously, we got the throughput and we got the latency graph. And I think we had a packet loss graph. Now we've got downlink and uplink quality separated. Right now the links are real stable. So we don't have anything showing up there. We'll generate some speed here in a second, see if we can't get some, uh, get some problems to show up here. Okay, so we got the speed ramping up. So we got a few problems starting to show up here. You can see we've got packets out of order being identified here. So in the uplink and downlink status, you've got packet fragmentation. If you're using forward air correction, you'll you'll see dots show up if if forward error correction is actually being utilized if they're having to reassemble packets. And you can also see redundant packets from, from WAN smoothing as well. So again, there's a lot more information here. And then my favorite view is this all WAN to WAN. This basically shows you all the active links in the tunnel. So here you can really start to see on the left, you've got the aggregate stats but then you can start peeling it out one WAN at a time. So we can see our broadband link is really clean. We're not having any of those errors down here that we see in the aggregate stats. So if we scroll over, you can see the cellular link, not that surprisingly, is where we're seeing some of the, the problems showing up. So again, these graphs are excellent for troubleshooting. If you click on the export button, you'll get, a, you'll get an image capture of the graph so that you can very easily show people. Now there is a lot of data here. So these are scalable graphics. So you can zoom in and see all of the details on each one. But really nice, easy export capability so that you can capture some evidence if you've got a, a problem you need to show to somebody else. Okay, the next one I'm going to show you is drop-in mode on the BR1 Mini. So I'm going to pull that up again and see if remote web admin is going to be my friend. It sure is. So, Like I said, drop-in mode, that's being expanded to all of our products. So again, as an example on the BR1 Mini, 
to use drop in mode for those of you that don't know drop in mode is turns the router into basically a transparent bridge so if you've got a customer that has like a third party firewall and they, they basically like the way their network works right now. They don't want to change their existing network, but they want to add some sort of SD-WAN capability. That, that's where drop-in mode comes in. It lets us transparently insert ourselves into the network without making any changes. And then it lets you add on those SD-WAN benefits to that existing network. So this is really common with MPLS connections. The customer doesn't want to renumber their network. And so we integrate into that that network address scheme using drop-in mode, and then we're able to, to bond in additional links with Speed Fusion. But to set that up, you go to your LAN settings, which isn't the most intuitive right away, but you see this right here, drop-in mode settings. That's all of a sudden available. And so what you need to do with drop-in mode is if, if the customer has, if you're on the if your customer has extra public IPs, you would just enter an unused public IP here under the LAN settings, and then you need to just enter the gateway, DNS servers. We're not going to be doing DHCP, so there's a, there's a bunch of notes here to just take in if you're using this. A lot of these settings suddenly aren't relevant in drop-in mode because, again, we're just bridging through. We've also got the shared IP option. So if your customer doesn't have extra public IPs, you can share whatever public IP their firewall might have. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility. So that's drop in mode. Next one I'll show you is the NTP server, the unbreakable time server. Okay, so here we've got an SDX with the add-on cellular module. So we've got a GPS time source coming from this device. So again, there's two layers to this. There's just enabling the NTP server itself. This does not require GPS, and it's as simple as a one check box. You turn it on and the peplink router will start responding to NTP requests on its LAN IP. So it's default gateway uh, address. So you don't really have to do much of all anything to get that working. Now the other option you've got, if we go under system, and then time, you can choose, you can now choose where the peplink gets its time source from. So by default, it's going to use a time server and you can use our peplink time server. If you want, that's automatic, or you can punch in your own custom time server. But now you've got two more options. You can just strictly use GPS as the time source for the router. Again, you need a product that actually has a cellular radio and GPS radio with antenna attached. And you can also use GPS with time server as a fallback. So if you're not 100% confident that GPS is always going to be available for that, that unit, you can prefer to use GPS as the time source and then fall back to a, an internet-based server. So we run into this a lot. You know, People use private networks quite often in public safety, government applications. And so those private networks often don't have any internet access by design. And so oftentimes those networks don't have a time server on them. So there's nowhere to get that time sync from. And so if you've got a private network, you can still reach GPS. That's a, that's a, one, -way, that's a one way stream. So it's totally safe to, to listen to the GPS time information and use that as your source. So again, people that have IP cameras, they need a, a really consistent time source so that all of the cameras in one location are going to be on the same exact time. Public safety has a lot of software systems that need accurate time source information. So this gives you that capability and, and much more flexible, especially in those private networks in scenarios. The next one I'm going to show you is deep packet inspection. So deep packet inspection shows up in several places in our, in our router. 
I showed you the application steering already. That's one place. Uh, QoS is another place that you'll see deep packet inspection being utilized. So if you click to add an application, we've got the normal categories you always saw before, but underneath those categories, there's a lot more applications. So we've got Twitch, Vivo, lots of the popular uh, video streaming services. Again, Netflix has been there for a little bit now but lots of different video services under there. Again, if we look under voice over IP, that includes things like Zoom and WebEx, so not just voice over IP, but also the web conferencing applications that people like. So again, lots of new, lots of new applications under here. Got OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox. Now you can also leverage these signatures for content blocking. Like let's say I just want to block Dropbox. I can just come down here, choose Dropbox, and I can block it. As easy as that. Same with Netflix. I don't want people at work doing Netflix, so we're going to shut that off as well. Now, the other thing I'll show you with DPI is the DPI reports. If you don't know how to turn these on in IC2, um, you can do this at the device level or at the group level. I'll show you at the device level here if you just click Edit. You just have to turn that little enable DPI to on. Not all products support the DPI engine, so you'll if you don't see that button there, you've probably got a, a router that doesn't support that. Now, if we go back to the group level, you can do this in bulk. So if I just click edit, I can check all the boxes, and under actions, I can click enable DPI. So that'll enable it on all the routers that support it in just a couple of clicks instead of having to do it one by one. But now that we've got that turned on, we can see reports for what we've been up to on this router. Now, once you turn it on, it's gonna only start collecting data at that point. So if you turn it on, you're gonna get kind of a disappointing report right away, but just give it, give it some time, let some, let some traffic build up and these reports should populate. I think every hour you'll see these update. So by default, it's showing you the graph based on percentage of volume, traffic volume, and then it's grouping by application category. So, okay, so 53% is web traffic and 24% is remote, remote access. To me, that doesn't mean a whole lot. It's nice to see it categorized, but if we uncheck that box, then you're gonna get more detail. So that web traffic is pretty much all Google. I'm a, I'm a very heavy Google user, so that's not surprising. Uh, we got a lot of SSH on this traffic. We got some speedtest.net, SSL. If you use this app, uh, this feature in the past, before we really expanded our DPI applications, the uh, the unclassified slice of the pie used to be a lot bigger. And so, again, as you can see, we've really really enhanced the the DPI capabilities to make these reports much more meaningful and useful. You can also do it based on number of packets. So depending on the, the perspective you're trying to look at. But again, traffic volume is usually what people are most concerned with. How much of this or that is being actually consumed on the links. So NetFlow, again, NetFlow is somewhat similar. We don't, we're not gonna be able to demonstrate it today but I'll show you how to configure it. You need to go to our not so secret support.cgi page. If you haven't been here, it's kind of an ugly page because there's all kinds of stuff that we haven't necessarily integrated into the GUI. This is where some of the more hidden features are shown. And right at the very bottom here, we've got NetFlow. We can just click on that. We can enable it. And again, NetFlow, you're sending it to an external NetFlow receiver or NetFlow server. And so you're going to choose whichever, 
whichever version and protocol is appropriate, tell it where, the, where that server lives, and it's gonna stream that NetFlow data to that external device. There's not a lot to set up there, and there's not a lot to see there unless you've got a NetFlow server to actually digest all that information. The next one I will show you is the TCP acceleration. So we're not, excel we're not directly doing TCP acceleration in Speed Fusion. I'm gonna actually delete this profile and start over so you can see because it's all hidden by default. Okay, by default, you're just gonna see this data port auto or custom. If you open that little tool tip there, you can configure which data stream protocol you're gonna use. You can switch it to TCP mode. And then this little checkbox exposes the TCP headers. So previously, if you don't check that box, even the TCP headers are going to be encrypted. If you check the box, we will expose the TCP headers, but the data packet payload, is, the payload of the data packet is still encrypted. So you're exposing a little bit of information to the network which allows those third-party external TCP accelerators to actually work and accelerate all of the encrypted traffic. Now you're gonna need to, th this will also expose all of the TCP ports for the source and destination for each session. So if you've got a, a Fusion Hub that's heavily locked down, you're gonna need to open the firewall up quite a bit on that to accommodate all those, all those TCP sessions that are suddenly being exposed. It's not gonna be limited to just the, the ports that you're establishing the tunnel with anymore when you expose those TCP sessions. Okay, I'm gonna show you WPA3 support now. I think this was the router that was giving me trouble earlier. We've got a bad router in the demo pool here, or a router on a bad connection, I should say. We'll take a look at another one and show you the controller side first, at least. So if we look at the AP controller on this SDX, we can turn that on. And under wireless SSID, we'll create a new one. And so the controller now supports WPA3 profiles. This would require an access point that also supports WPA3. So again, right now, all of our Wave 2 access points support that in firmware today. All of the 11AC products will also support that in a future release. I think there should be a beta of that AP firmware very soon. So you'll be able to try that out on most of our modern Wi-Fi access points. But it's not a lot different than WPA2 or 1. It's just more secure. So the setup is really not any different. You just select the mode you want, enter your key in. Again, we've got the fast roaming support so you can get enterprise grade handoff between access points. That's been there for a little bit. And so that covers WPA3. Let's see if this other one popped up. I don't think so. trying to load, but I've got this on a cellular connection with poor, poor signal. There we go. Cool. So I've got a profile in here, WPA3 test. You can see it's set to WPA3 personal. And so this is a Balance 20X, one of our new products. This has built-in Wave 2 Wi-Fi. So this product already by default supports WPA3 on its integrated access point. 
And so you can see that's being broadcast right there. So the last thing I'll show you here, again, we don't have a NetFlow server stood up and running. So you can just see here is an example of a third party NetFlow analyzer interface. So again, it's gonna be somewhat similar to what we showed you in the DPI reports, but uh, NetFlow is a much more scalable uh, enterprise or service provider oriented way to keep track of all your traffic flows across all your different locations and routers and devices. So that covers all the demo content and slides for today. I'm gonna just dig into some of the questions here. Give me just a second and we'll see what, see what people are curious about. Okay, the first question, what models support SpeedFusion Cloud? I love this question because it's easy. All of our, all of our products support SpeedFusion Cloud except for Fusion Hub. Fusion Hub's already in the cloud so that doesn't connect to Speed Fusion Cloud itself, but you can connect a router to one of your own Fusion Hubs and Speed Fusion Cloud simultaneously if you, if you so choose to. I see another question, can you have more than one cellular connection up simultaneously? I, I'm assuming that question is referring to a Speed Fusion, either Speed Fusion Cloud or a regular Speed Fusion profile, and the answer is yes, if you have a product that supports bonding. So you need a router that supports speed fusion bonding. And again, like I showed in the, in the GUI, you just need to set those cellular connections to the same priority group inside of that speed fusion profile. So any connections you link in the same priority group will be bonded together. Can the GPS info be used to update time zone automatically based on location coordinates? So, NTP is going to only tell you what the UTC time is, and then it's up to the device to actually set its own time zone. So an NTP server won't set a time zone for a device. Again, you have to tell the device what time zone it's in. So um, for third-party devices, the answer to that is no. Um, for mobile devices, like a, a Max router, if you've got a Max router that's kind of trotting the globe, I'm not sure on that one. You might, that, that's an interesting thought. If you've got something that's kind of on a ship or something, do you, I assume the question is, can you get the router to kind of change its time zone relative to where it's located at that time? I'm not sure on that. I think the answer to that is probably no though. Which models support the NTP server functionality? All of the models support that. Um, and then the GPS time sync, like I said, you have to have a product with cellular radio and GPS radio on there to get that GPS time sync, but you don't need that for the NTP server functionality. Question on, do we recommend setting up WPA3 or WPA3 versus uh, 3 slash 2 for current devices? Um, I'm, I unfortunately am not probably the most informed person to advise you on that. Um, you know, WPA3 slash 2 is definitely going to work better for compatibility. I'm not sure if there are significant trade-offs there from a security perspective as opposed to just running in a pure WPA3 mode. Um, pure WPA3 is obviously going to limit some client devices. There's going to be certainly client devices that don't support WPA3. So if you go purely WPA3, you very likely will have some sort of compatibility issues to deal with. Um, but again, I can't advise you whether or not that trade-off is worth it uh, compared to whatever kind of security uh, trade-offs you might have by doing the mixed mode WPA3 and WPA2. Another question is asking for a use case for SpeedFusion Cloud. So again, SpeedFusion Cloud is just taking the infrastructure out of, out of people's hands so that you can rapidly deploy SpeedFusion SD-WAN without having to set up the infrastructure side. So there's lots of benefits, right? If you wanna protect voice over IP traffic, if you wanna 
get faster uploads to Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, if you're a video streamer and you travel all over the world, you're going to want to connect to different cloud nodes regardless of where you're at instead of having to set up nodes all around the world. Uh, so those are some examples of, of reasons you might use the Speed Fusion Cloud. But in, in short, it's just to be able to get the benefits of Speed Fusion without having to set up that remote side of it. It's just automating that whole, that whole setup process for you. So I don't see any other questions. I can give it another 15 or 30 seconds here. See if there's any more that pop up. All right, other than that, here's some links to all of our socials. And as always, check out our forum. There's so much good information in there. All right, folks, thanks for joining us. Take care.